Uh, so good morning, everyone, and welcome to uh, virtual Westchester Jewish Center in uh, Mamaroneck, New York. Uh, my name is Jacques Steinberg. I'm proud to be a congregant at WJC for uh, 18 years and counting now. And uh, this, our program this morning is anti-Semitism, Brexit, and coronavirus, and ABC. If you uh, think back, anti-Semitism, Brexit, coronavirus, and ABC of UK, British Jewish public policy. Um, this program uh, is being recorded. Um, it is being hosted by the dynamic and creative uh, World Jewry Committee at Westchester Jewish Center. And uh, we're very, very grateful this morning to have a very special guest with us, uh, Phil Rosenberg. Uh, Phil, good morning and welcome and good afternoon where you are. Good afternoon from London. It's, it's, I have to say, Holly, Holly Fink is our uh, our uh, executive producer and uh, creative guide, and, and Holly, to hear good morning uh, from London uh, is, uh, or good afternoon from London on our WJC program is uh, yet another milestone for the, the programming you've led all year. So uh, for those of you who have not met Phil, Phil is Director of Public Affairs at the Board of Deputies of British Jews, and we're gonna learn in a moment a little more about that. The National Representative Body of the UK Jewish Community, founded in 1760, which by my math is older than the United States. Um, a recognized leader in interfaith relation, relations in the UK, Phil previously ran a Muslim Jewish dialogue group at Oxford University before becoming the executive director of the Faiths Forum for London. Since 2014, he has been co-chair of the Faiths Leader Forum in the London Borough of Camden, where he has also served as an elected local councillor until 2018, representing the Labour Party. Again, what a fascinating biography, Phil, you bring to us at the WJC as we learn. Uh, I am very privileged this morning to be joined by a co-host. Uh, he is another WJC member named Brian Fink. And uh, to the extent Westchester Jewish Center has a Prince Harry and Meghan Markle, uh, I would offer to you today, they are a Brian Fink and, and Holly Fink. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and with that, I will um, welcome you, Brian. And Brian, for those in our community who may not know you as well as others, um, yeah. tell us briefly about your story and, and your yeah. journey from Britain to, to the US. Yeah, so um, thank you very much, Jack, for that introduction. Uh, never been called uh, Prince Harry before, but there you go. Um, yeah, so I've been uh, part of the Westchester Jewish Centre for about 17 years now, um, <clears throat> since my kids were little. So, and I've been in the States for just over 20, um, so quite a long time. Uh, but obviously I was raised, born and raised uh, in the UK in Manchester. And uh, Manchester's a fairly small Jewish community, although it is the second biggest in the UK. Um, and, uh, you know, I grew up in a fairly uh, non-religious background, but a reasonable, you know, reasonably Zionist background. And uh, Israel was a big part of our lives growing up. And um, I was also involved fairly politically uh, with the Jewish society at university. Um, and uh, now we're sort of, my family's spread all over the world. So I'm glad to see my sister here with uh, her family is on from London. Um, but I also have family uh, in Israel as well. Um, and, um, you know, it's uh, great to be here and um, looking forward for this, looking forward to this conversation. Thanks, okay. Brian. It's a pleasure to have you here uh, offering uh, expert uh, commentary. This is, uh, again, this is like our version of WJC of, uh, of Breakfast at Wimbledon, and uh, Brian is uh, our, our color commentator. So um, for those joining us today, we, we want this to be a conversation. Um, I have a few questions for Phil just to sort of get us going. I'm going to uh, then turn things to Brian to go a little more in depth, and, and then we're hoping that you all listening will join the conversation. So please, um, type questions into the chat uh, as we're speaking, as things come to mind. Um, and, uh, and, and we will then turn to those questions at a certain point. And, uh, and, and we'd love to get all of us involved in the conversation. So, so Phil, again, thank you for being with us. I'm, I'm a proxy for the, the portion of our audience that, that maybe we should say we assume no knowledge. Uh, I've, I've been to the London and to Britain and spent time there, but, but let's start sort of broad and then you and Brian can can take us a bit more into the details. So um, can you first provide an, an overview, uh, Phil, of the UK British community? How large of it is it? Where do folks live? And, and, and what's the breakdown in terms of denominations? Sure, well, first of all, can I say a huge thank you to Holly, Brian and yourself, Jack, for 
inviting me on this morning with you and this afternoon with me. It's a great pleasure to be with you all. I look forward to our conversation. Uh, so the UK Jewish community, there's 300,000 of us approximately. Um, about two thirds of that, 200,000 or so, are in London and, the, and sort of the wider London area. Uh, and as Brian mentioned earlier, the second largest community is Manchester. And then there are smaller communities progressively in Leeds and Glasgow, but there are, there are Jews registered in every local authority area across the United Kingdom. So these might be very, very small groups or individuals in some cases, but Jews are spread across the country. Um, and what you've kind of seen in the recent decades is a concentration of Jewish communities. There used to be more Jewish communities in terms of having infrastructure across the country, but increasingly the big metropolitan centres, particularly London and Manchester, are kind of hoovering up Jewish uh, folks as those centers of Jewish life become more and more exciting in terms of restaurants and cultural spaces and so on. Um, the exception to that rule is that there are now growing outposts of the Haredi community. The Haredi community in the UK is the fastest growing part of the UK Jewish community. It's roughly around 15% of those who are affiliated in some ways are part of the Haredi community. And because of the prices in inner London, um, particularly where the community is clustered, they started setting up outposts, outposts on, on sort of in seaside towns around the east coast of the UK, which is a really interesting new phenomenon. Uh, and I've had the pleasure of visiting some of those communities. In terms of kind of the, the, the breakdown of denominations, it's quite different to the United States in the following way. In the United States, as I understand it, no one denomination really has a, a kind of majority. There's, there's large groups of orthodox, reform, conservative, and so on. In the United Kingdom, there's a very, very strong orthodox majority by those who are affiliated. So 55% uh, sort of centrist, um, modern orthodox uh, by affiliation, not necessarily fully practicing, but are, are members of synagogues that are of that stand. And then another 15%, as I said, Haredi which means 70% is some form of orthodoxy, but at least by affiliation. And then you have 20% reform, about 8% liberal, and then much smaller, 3% Masorti or conservative, and 3% Spanish and Portuguese, uh, another kind of mostly orthodox uh, by, affiliate, by practice, um, yeah, whether, uh, however intense the religious observance is. And the two bits that are growing fastest, as I said, the Haredi component and Masorti, uh, which the conservative part is also growing quite quickly, but from, a, 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 as I say, small numbers. And, and, and what's interesting about those numbers in a historical perspective is that the Jewish community that came back to the UK and the people were expelled from what was then England in 1290. And then the Jewish community returned in 1650, well, was legally allowed to return in 1656. And those people were all Spanish and Portuguese, people who... Uh, were descended from those Jews expelled from Spain, who had moved primarily to Amsterdam in, in what is now Holland or the Netherlands, and came to London and, and other parts of, um, of, the, of England and, and then across the UK, what was to come the UK uh, over time. But then you had waves of immigration, particularly in the late 19th century, Ashkenazi became, came to dominate, particularly after the pogroms in Eastern Europe. And suddenly there was a switch. And actually the name of the Board of Deputies a very curious name of the organization that I work for, which was founded as, as Jackson in 1760, was because the people who founded it were Portuguese speakers. And originally it was diputados, which is the word for delegate or representative. Uh, and, and, and so the organization was kind of founded in this kind of hybrid language. Um, but over time, as I say, Ashkenazim came to dominate. There was obviously more waves in immigration around the 30s and 40s, refugees from uh, Nazi Germany and Eastern Europe again. And then another wave in the 50s and 60s, Mizrahi Jews kind of fleeing either the breakdown of, of their traditional homelands in the Arab, Arab world and, and Iran, but also the breakup of the British Empire in those years as well. So you had people coming in those ways. And that's kind of the way that the, the, the UK Jewish community looks. That's a, just a fabulous grounding, Phil, and uh, you covered uh, a lot of, uh, of, of demographic range. Um, let's try to put a little bit of a human face now on those numbers. And I know it's unfair and impossible to generalize given all the different flavors of, of, of Jewish denomination that you've sketched out. But um, imagine us in the US, um, what does it feel like to wake up Jewish in Britain right now? What, 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 how would you characterize in general um, British Jewish life? 
Generally speaking, it is very, very good. There is a, a real flourishing, particularly in the last few years, in the last decade, particularly of cultural institutions. There's a real kind of confidence about uh, the British Jewish identity. That was rocked, and I think we're going to come on to this in a bit, in, from 2015 until last year, by uh, the rise of Jeremy Corbyn in the Labour Party, which really shook the confidence of the Jewish community as this kind of sense of anti-Semitism coming into mainstream politics uh, without being properly fought back was, was there. It was a bit of a, a rough, rough ride, I can say, and that combined with the uncertainties provided by Brexit. Again, we, I know we're going to speak about it a bit. But actually, since Jeremy Corbyn's departure and the increasing kind of return of normalcy to the Labour Party and mainstream politics, uh, that, 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 that kind of um, jolt is, is gone. And actually, um, coronavirus aside, which um, I know is not fun for any of us, really, um, it, it's a pretty good time to be a British Jew, I'd say. So uh, and you may, that may be the takeaway from this call this morning. We'll see that it's a pretty good time to do it. British Jew. We don't uh, take that for granted. Uh, you mentioned the Board of Deputies. Just, just go a beat further with us. What is the role of the organization you lead in British Jewish life? Sure. So, as I said, 1760 is founding, and it was founded to make a loyal presentation to uh, the new king of the time, George III. And it was felt the British Jewish community at that time was feeling increasingly established, conf more confident. It had just been recognized in the, in, in the country for just under a century and it wanted to make its presence known. So it came and delivered a loyal address. And, and what the Board of Deputies is today is an organization of around 203 different member organizations, synagogues and Jewish institutions from across the denominational spectrum, from across uh, the United Kingdom, uh, who send about 300 deputies, they still, they still call deputies, to meet about eight times a year in what is the equivalent of a Jewish parliament. So if you imagine this group of people representing all the different denominations, different interests, secular groups, pro-Israel groups, uh, welfare institutions, all meeting to discuss the issues of the day, that is the, the deputies. And they elect every three years, and as it happens, it's next Sunday is the three yearly cycle elections, a president who's the elected leader of the UK Jewish community and kind of vice presidents who kind of work to, like they have portfolios almost like members of a cabinet that, that look at things like anti-Semitism or international affairs or community and education issues. Uh, and then, yeah, and, and so there is that elected structure. And to that elected structure, there's a merry band of about 15 of us who are sort of like the civil service of the Jewish community. We advise the leadership, the elected leadership on what's happening in the fields in which we kind of have levels, levels of expertise. They decide as the democratic leaders and then we implement their decisions. And um, that's, that's how the Board of Deputies works. Thank you. Last question uh, from me before I throw Phil to our distinguished co-host. Um, let's, let's tackle one of our ABCs. We're talking about anti-Semitism, Brexit, and coronavirus today. Let's, let's get a grounding in Brexit. Uh, can you just give us the basics of, of Brexit and, and remind us why it occurred and also whether um, there has been sort of a general Jewish take on Brexit? Yeah, so, uh, I mean, let's start with the first part. Why did Brexit occur? Um, I think, like, in many ways, this is, there's a similar phenomenon in America, which we saw with the rise of Donald Trump, but sort of questions of identity and, and questions about how we relate as a country to the global, the increasingly globalised world. And um, there had been, for years, rumblings of discontent with the European Union, uh, a kind of... Uh, body that brings together what were 28 states across Europe to try and uh, coordinate on different areas of policy. Uh, and people, some people sort of felt uh, concerned. And, and really the Brexit campaign focused on what they called taking back control of what they were money, law and borders. And what this meant was they wanted to stop sub, um, the British UK payment into the European Union. All the member states have to pay in to, to be part of the club. They wanted laws to be only made in the UK, whereas um, in the EU, sort of certain laws are made by the, the whole entity and all the states have to then follow them. And, uh, and one of the features of being a member of the European Union was that there's free movement of people, goods and services across borders. So that meant that the UK couldn't have a fully independent immigration policy for those within the European Union. And, and, and those who wanted to leave the European Union felt that was important. Now, 
when we say that vote, it was a very narrow vote, really. It was 52 to 48 percent. It was so quite close. And what we had for various years after that vote in 2016 to leave the European Union was backwards and forwards between those two different tribes, the what were called the Brexiteers and the Remainers, the people remain as the 48% who still wanted to be part of the European Union. And that has been, it, it paralyzed the UK politics for a long time. So that, so in the end, the Brexiteers won out and particularly Boris Johnson's uh, big victory in the general election in 2019 gave the Brexiteers a mandate to fully deliver Brexit. And so we are now out of the European Union. Now, where does this leave the Jews? Well, first of all, it should be said, the Jews did not, the Jewish community did not take a position on Brexit. Um, Many Jews had strong views on the issue. Some were very, very pro-Remain, some were very pro-Leave. Um, but uh, the institutions of the Jewish community said, this is not a Jewish matter per se, we'll stand back and let, let the country decide and then we'll take a view. Once the country had voted to leave the European Union, uh, my organization uh, particularly looked at what would be the impacts of the Jewish community on that, of that decision. And interestingly, there were things that impacted the Jewish community that we had to work with the government to make sure uh, did not carry over. And these were things like the following. Under, whilst the UK was in the European Union, trade with Israel, which is obviously important to many people in the Jewish community, was governed by uh, agreements between the European Union and Israel. The European Union made agreements on behalf of all of its members. So we were concerned that there would be suddenly no agreements about flights, no agreements about how to do trade with Israel. It could have been quite damaging. Uh, and particularly as Israel is a relatively small country, we worried it would be quite low down the queue in terms of priority. As it happened, uh, and we were advocates for a quick deal, Israel was one of the first countries to sign a continuity trade agreement with the UK, so that was sorted. Another issue came in the area of terrorist designations and sanctions. Um, because of the common policy framework, organizations like the political wing of Hamas, um, the Popular Front for uh, Liberation of Palestine, Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigades, were designated by the European Union and as a con consequence by the UK. But the UK hadn't had to designate them themselves. And we were worried that in all the massive amounts of complexity that govern the UK's departure, it would be forgotten that these terrorist organisations could suddenly, if they didn't transfer that over, set up shop in the UK when they wouldn't have been able to do so in, in the European Union when the UK is part of that. So making sure the government rolled over those sanctions uh, was, was important. And then there were various things to do with the trade, kosher meat. You know, uh, we import some, about a third of our kosher meat from the European Union. So making sure that there weren't suddenly tariffs that made this premium product all the more expensive and unreachable. So funnily enough, there were all these kind of things we had to work out and we spent a lot of time talking to the government, but all of them thankfully were resolved. But um, yeah, hopefully that, that gives you a sense of it. Fascinating to think of Brexit in the context of, of kosher meat. Um, a, a reminder to those of you who are participants, whether you are a Westchester Jewish Center member or whether you're one of our guests today, please lob questions into the chat um, for Phil and, and we will turn to your questions a bit later in the program. And with that, Brian, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, 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 no, no worries. Thank, thank you, Jack. <clears throat> so I think that's, that's been really interesting so far, Phil. Really, you know, a bit of a history lesson there around uh, the formation of the Board of Deputies, which was good. Um, but what I wanted to chat to you about a little bit now is the politics in the UK um, and really talk about, um, you know, the extreme left versus the extreme right and, and you know, how anti-Semitism has come about in the UK in recent years. Um, so, you know, as a lot of people here know, uh, we had a, a left-wing leader of the Labour Party, Jeremy Corbyn, in power for several years in the UK, um, who, you know, um, really, you know, started to, uh, well, had, had didn't really have anti-Semitic policies, but there were a lot of anti-Semitic members of the of the party who caused a lot of problems for the Jewish community. Can you talk a little bit about how he came to power and then how the Jewish community reacted to him being in power? I think that would be a good, if you could talk about that a little bit, that'd be great. Sure. Um, so in common with a lot of um, kind of uh, the center left of politics, to an extent in the US, but mostly in Europe, there was a bit of a crisis of the centre-left um, in the sense of uh, it, it being stuck, really, between two different, very different constituencies of people that the centre-left has served. Kind of metropolitan liberals who kind of have all the sort of liberal, various kinds of liberal values and working-class people 
uh, particularly white working class people spread across the country. And previously, uh, the Labour Party, like many other social democratic movements, had been able to straddle that coalition of people. But in, in recent decades, that's been a harder and harder bridge to, to, to make in the sense that the cultural values of those groups um, seem to be splitting apart um, in terms of uh, what the what some you know might describe as a woke agenda of the metropolitan liberals versus kind of traditional values of the white working class. Uh, and, and one of the things about Brexit and, um, uh, is that it ex exploited that difference of, between those two different groups of people that had been previously constituents of the Labour Party. Anyway, what this meant was that Labour kept losing elections. And um, in the search for a new identity, uh, Labour decided whatever it was doing wasn't working and it decided to try, its membership overall decided to try more radical, something more radical. And Jeremy Corbyn was very different to other kinds of politicians. He didn't triangulate. He, you know, he said he spoke very much to what he meant. And a lot of people, whether they exactly agreed with him or not, liked that kind of refreshing honesty. I, I think in many ways, analogous to Donald Trump, although a very different kind of politics, people like that kind of plain speaking sort of um, political uh, agenda. So he, he won. It was quite a big surprise. He was really not expected to. In fact, he had to beg votes from people, uh, his parliamentary colleagues who didn't want to support him to get even onto the ballot paper, if you like. Uh, and then he won. And uh, this was immediately recognized as a challenge for us because Jeremy Corbyn, for all what one might say about him, had been for years allied with not just the Palestinian cause, but with quite extreme elements in the Palestinian cause. Uh, he had appeared on pl platforms with representatives of Hamas and Hezbollah, uh, appeared at rallies by where people were kind of waving Hezbollah flags. Um, you know, it, it just seemed that you know this was not mainstream dialogue. And actually, I'll, I'll tell you a very brief story. I, I I went on a delegation of Christian and Jewish leaders to to Israel and the Palestinian territories, and among the people we met was this young leader of Fatah, uh, the P, the PLO, mm -hmm. and he gave us a talk about you know his <laughs> perspective on things. Which you can imagine was not particularly pro-Israel. Um, but he started his talk by saying he was very pleased to meet this group, group of British uh, Jews and Christians because he'd lived in the UK and he'd worked actually for an MP who turned out to be kind of famous now. He'd worked for Jeremy Corbyn. And at the end of his talk, I said to him, privately at the end, I said, you used to work for Jeremy Corbyn. I said, he said, yes. I said, can I ask you a question? He said, sure. I said, when you, when you work for him, did you, you're, you're a Fatah guy, you work with the PLO and you're obviously great rivals with Hamas. Did you ever say to Jeremy Corbyn, don't work with Hamas? work with the PLO, he said, yes, I did say it to him, and he wouldn't listen to me, which kind of tells you the, the, the challenge we were up against as the Jewish community in trying to persuade Jeremy Corbyn about uh, where his positions were, were problematic. Anyway, what his attitude meant that he had a real blind spot towards anti-Semitic manifestations, particularly of anti-Israel attitudes, but also uh, and, uh, expressions of anti-Semitism related to kind of wealth and, and power. Um, I think the far left in general uh, has elements of, of anti-imperialism, which they often sort of associate Israel with being an imperialist colonialist exercise, and anti-capitalism. And there's often this kind of association with Jews with being capitalists. Now, whatever one thinks about those Jews, they happen to be what the far left thinks. And therefore, Jews kind of got connected in their mind with both that anti-imperialist and that anti-capitalist wing, which meant that you had all these people with feverish anti-Semitic conspiracy theories uh, joining the Labour Party, particularly to support Jeremy Corbyn, which made it extremely uncomfortable. I, I, yes. I as, uh, as, as Jack member mentioned, was also a Labour councillor during that period. And I saw the party switch from being a place where being Jewish was generally a positive thing, occasionally difficult debates about Israel, but nothing I would call anti-Semitic, uh, to being a place where people were viciously targeting me personally, trying to push Jews out of the party, very vicious, uh, behavior in terms of local party meetings that usually have been quite a boring affair became very, very vicious. It, it became deeply unpleasant. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that's great. I mean, obviously, the um, <clears throat> the left wing in America is slightly different, right? We do have a, a more radical left wing element to the Democratic Party, right, with the squad and Bernie Sanders and what have you. But I mean, generally, it's not as extreme as what has been experienced in the UK. Um, but I think that, you know, the other the other side of this is really on the right wing, right, where we have seen 
anti-Semitism in the US, right? On, we, we, we have white supremacy has been a, a really uh, big issue in the US recently, and we had um, uh, an anti-Semitic attack, right, in Pittsburgh um, at the Tree of Life Synagogue. Uh, and that really, you know, shook up the Jewish community and certainly the WJC as well, right? We, we've seen a lot of additional security now put in place, and it's been a big, um, what I would call a sort of a big shakeup of how people feel about being Jewish and and how secure people feel, feel like being, uh, you know, at the moment, certainly in, in Westchester and probably throughout the US. So um, maybe you can talk a little bit about right wing anti semitism in the UK, and if that is a big problem now, or um, you know, has it been a big problem in the past as well? Sure. Um, well, first of all, might might my, my say that we we really felt the attack on Pittsburgh in the UK as well. Um, it was felt to you know we have a lot of identification, obviously family ties, but also identification with the US Jewish community in general. And to see that terrible attack really shook us. Um, my organization uh, within forty eight hours organized a, a vigil event, was sold out within fifteen minutes of it. <laughs> we were doing physical events at the time, so we had limited space, but fifteen minutes. People all wanted to show their solidarity. The Home Secretary uh, came, the Mayor of London came, the US Ambassador, Israeli Ambassador, all the rabbis from across, mm -hmm. Chief Rabbi, every spectrum of Judaism was represented, but we really felt that identification with, with what the US community has gone through then and since in Poe and other, other places as well. Uh, we keep a close eye on that. Um, look, it, far right anti-Semitism has been a, a, a problem in the UK in a, in a way for a long time. I mean, in the 1930s, you had uh, groups like Oswald Mosley's Black Shirts kind of marching in sympathy with the aims of the Nazis. There was a famous standoff at Cable Street in East London where uh, Jews, trade unionists and communists actually blocked the path of the far right marches. It's, uh, there's murals celebrating it. It's, um, it's an interesting part of history. Actually, ignominiously, one of the board of deputies told Jews to stay away from. They didn't want, they, they, they wanted to sort it out in a different way. And we've, we've, one of the many times we've been on the wrong side of history, to be honest, but, um, um, but that was a, a major moment. And the far right kind of pops up every so often. In the 1980s, the National Front and the British National Party have been a feature. But a lot of the kind of political element of the far right got hoovered up in the Brexit movement, actually. I mean, the Brexit movement was not only you know, I wouldn't say it was primarily a racist movement, but people who were, had that anti-immigration, anti-minority sense kind of got hoovered up into that thing, which kind of diluted them in a funny sort of way. Mm. Uh, that being said, there's a, a rising concern about far-right organizations. The, the Home Office here continues to ban them. We've had to speak out, you know, it's, while it's different, against elements of the Conservative Party who've expressed views that we consider to be anti-Semitic. And we continue to try and press for the Conservative Party to do enough about those people. In some cases they have, some cases I think they could have done more. Uh, there's this kind of blurring of the lines of this populist right as well to the far right. The populist right kind of is acceptable in a sense, um, whereas the far right is not. And there's, there's a bit of a blurring which we have to deal with. One thing I'd say which is a learning for us, which I think is useful for, for friends in America to think about, well, perhaps two things. One is that in the past, uh, we used to think as long as you have good relations with the leaders of the political parties, the main political parties, the Conservative and Labour, you're all right. They'll manage their grassroots. What we learned about in the Labour situation is actually ignore the grassroots at your peril. Ignore what's happening in the wider margins because you never know when there'll suddenly be a big change and that, that, that what was a marginal voice will become the mainstream voice is what happened in, in the Labour Party. Likewise, one could be concerned about that in the Conservative Party. And I think that there are analogous situations both in democratic politics and republican politics in the us so it's something that i think the jewish community has to be always mindful of not just what's in the center but what's in the margins as well because you never know when it's going to come to the center and the other thing and we might be about to talk about it brian is is social media and the change that's that's uh, that's brought about yeah yeah so certainly uh, go in that direction i'd also like you to bring you bring you up to the sort of the current day as well with the new leadership of the Labour Party and also um, slightly variant topic, but also you know what's going on in Scotland as well, right? And the potential breakup of the UK, right? How do, you know if we get to more of the modern day, where what is the position of the Jewish community with some of these other sort of political activities going on? Sure. Well, okay. So take those in turn. Uh, Jeremy, uh, Jeremy Corbyn was formally stepped down as leader in April last year. So we're just over a year, year and a month uh, um, from when he stepped down. And Keir Starmer, who came in to replace him, 
has wrought massive changes. I mean, he said in his first speech uh, that uh, he wanted to, he, he apologized to the Jewish community for the stain of anti Semitism, that he wanted to tear out anti Semitism by its roots. It was something he was very conscientious about. On his first day, he wrote to our organization, to our president, to ask for an urgent meeting to begin this process of change. Uh, he has been extremely forward leaning and he's taken some very difficult decisions in terms, including, in fact, suspending Jeremy Corbyn from the Labour Party um, when uh, a, a legal report, in, there was a, a legal challenge to Labour during the Jeremy Corbyn years that actually didn't come out until October when Jeremy Corbyn had left. So a body called the Equality and Human Rights Commission, which is a kind of quasi governmental body that analyzes equality and human rights in the UK, basically, set up by the Labour government, the last Labour government. Uh, and it found that Labour had broken the law in its treatment of Jewish people in terms of the way that it treated uh, cases of anti-Semitism. And whereas Keir Starmer accepted the report in full immediately, Jeremy Corbyn said, well, you know, it's, there's a bit of a, you know, it's been overstated um, by enemies of the party. And, and Keir Starmer said, this is unacceptable. You know, you should have kept quiet if you had nothing good to say. And he was suspended, which of course has been a bit of a crisis for the, La the La Labour Party because its former leader is now suspended, but it showed the, the strength of resolve that Keir Starmer has had. And I think, you know, in, in a year, tremendous progress has been made. There are still problems. We're still hearing about individuals who are anti-Semitic. Labour had to suspend, I think, another 12 people last week uh, from a particular party, but it's now not in the leadership, it's in the grassroots. But there does seem to be a kind of determined action uh, about that. I'm happy to speak more about it if you'd like. Uh, in terms of Scotland, Funnily enough, the last conversation I had before logging on today was with our affiliate body in Scotland, the Scottish Council of Jewish Communities, and it is becoming a major question. Now, we've got a major devolved elections happening, local and devolved elections happening on Thursday this week. And um, the Scottish National Party, which is the party that's pro independent Scottish independence, is looking very strong, may well win an outright majority, which brings back the question of whether Scotland should remain part of the United Kingdom. Um, um, you know, we don't take a view on that. Again, it's a constitutional question that the Jewish community sort of stands out of, but there are relevant questions, because as I said, the Scottish Jewish community is quite small uh, in terms of the way it is funded. It relies a lot on being part of the UK family and funding coming across um, from London as well to support Scottish institutions. Um, so it, it is a question and uh, something we've just announced uh, in the last few months with that, that body, the Scottish Council of Jewish Communities, we're going to be investing in them to give them a bit of a additional capacity over the next 18 months, whatever the outcome of Thursday's election is, because um, it is going to be very relevant, the question of whether they become an independent country with an independent Jewish system, as what happened in Ireland, remember the, what is now the Republic of Ireland used to be part of the United Kingdom and so uh, was part of the Board of Deputies. They, they've moved on, they have an independent Jewish leadership, which we work very closely with. Uh, or do we kind of have some sort of federal Jewish structure that ignores the reality of independence? Um, either way, the Scottish nationalists are a major force in politics. And, and because of the powers that individual regions now have, we, we are concerned that if Scotland sneezes, the rest of the UK could catch a cold. In, in questions like kosher meat, you know, if they, they have the power of agriculture to ban uh, kosher slaughter, I don't think there's any realistic chance of that happening. In fact, they've all given us videos this week, the leaders of all the parties in Scotland assuring us they won't. But we have to keep a close eye on what's happening in the devolved regions, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, London yeah. as well. Okay, no, that's, that's 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 really interesting. And then you know, I think let's just move on to sort of the last topic, coronavirus, right? So, mm. um, you know, obviously that is impacting everybody, um, including the Jewish community in the UK and all over the world. Um, is there any specific Jewish take or uh, within the UK on the coronavirus? Yeah, um, a few things. Well, first of all, we we as the Board of Deputies have the, had the grim task of recording um, the number of deaths in the Jewish community from coronavirus, which is um, thankfully plateauing now, but it's been, it's over 900 uh, Jewish people have died um, through, throughout the course of the pandemic. Um, we're now down to zero and one returns per week at the moment, but, you know, that was up to 35 per week at, you know, at one stage, it was, uh, it was, it was, it was quite grim. Um, there have been things we've had to do, you know, as the as the government's been trying to work out what it how it how it responds to the crisis and how it closes down various kinds of institutions when it can open them. 
we've been in regular dialogue in terms of advising the government about <laughs> opening and closing of synagogues and other Jewish spaces. Um, very early on, the government brought in what was called the coronavirus bill, the coronavirus act as it became, to try and give the government the powers it needed to take emergency power over all aspects of life, basically. <clears throat> now, it was obviously had to do that in a very short period of time, as we know countries were caught unawares by the virus. But one of the things that really came out uh, was that there was a phrase in the bill which meant that local authorities could decide to cremate en masse all the people who died. Now, obviously, different parts of Judaism have different views on this, but the majority view in Judaism is cremation is not something we uh, are going for. It's something that's, in fact, prohibited by most strands of Judaism. Uh, and, and, in fact, also, there was, they were also able to decide to bury en masse, which would have been bad for Hindus who all cremate. So one of the things we had to do over a weekend, basically, was explain to the government why this was a problem and get the government to do something the government very rarely does, which is put down an amendment to its own bill. Uh, and uh, at one point, I was having to distill 3,000 years of Jewish law into a text to the minister to, to say, this is what we need. And the government did um, agree to that. We worked with Muslim communities, with the Labour Party and the government to make sure that we had that agreement on that change. So it was smoothly done. But, you know, helping to advise the government on how we go has been important. The other aspect, I suppose, that's been particularly noticeable is with the Haredi community. And that's been something, I suppose, that's been noted in Israel and the States and in the UK. And us trying to work with government and Haredi communities, we've been convening roundtables with Haredi leaders to try and make sure that they understand. We've been putting government guidance out in Yiddish to make sure that we reach every part of that community as far as we can to try and prevent breaches. Unfortunately, we have seen some and we've had to speak out against those breaches. But uh, gen generally speaking, it's meant that I think we've had a better run of it in the U UK than perhaps in, in, in the US and in Israel on that score. Okay, that's, that, that's, uh, that's certainly interesting. Um, yeah, so a couple more topics before we sort of head off to some questions. Um, Black Lives Matter being, being a huge topic in the US recently, right, with the death of George Floyd. Uh, and I know that there were some, uh, you know, uh, demonstrations in the in the UK as well, right, in, in uh, support of <clears throat> Black Lives Matter. And um, so in terms of, you know, systemic racism and, and things like that, which we're sort of fighting against in the US, does the, does the UK have a similar problem? I think the, the race murder of George Floyd uh, provoked a reckoning, really, on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, you know, we're in the UK, our police are generally not armed. Um, which I think makes a, a really it makes it a different experience. But too many uh, young black people, particularly black men, have died in, in interactions with the police in the UK. There are massive inequalities in terms of health, education, employment, uh, and access to the justice system more generally. And I think um, you know, so so we as a as a country and we as a community felt a lot of, of concern about what we were seeing, uh, and we spoke out at the time about the murder of George Floyd. Um, but also what that provoked, we, we had um, questions within our own community, black members of our own community and other members of minority groups within the, the racial minorities within the Jewish community said, you know, it's not so great for us either. And uh, we launched, um, I think, which is a first for the Jewish community anywhere in the world, a commission on racial inclusivity in the Jewish community, chaired by a very prominent journalist who's both black and Jewish um, called Stephen Bush. Um, and um, it's just reported two weeks ago, it came out with 119 recommendations for the Jewish community to change things um, and make things better for uh, minorities within it, black Jews, Jews of color, Mizrahi Jews, whose experiences are not always good. And, and the, the range of things, I mean, I, I won't go through all 119 recommendations, it's on our website, I, I commend it. And I think it's, it's a useful exercise. There'll be much to learn, I think, across all communities for this, but things like engagement with security, um, we have a uh, testimony that speaks about profiling, which really is, actually isn't legal, but it seems that people are sometimes profiled. Sometimes non-Jewish security guards are telling Jewish people who happen to be black that they're not allowed in. It's a kind of very uncomfortable reality. So we have made recommendations for how we change that. We've asked synagogues to all have some already do, but welcoming committees that um, make sure that people's experience is, is positive once they've, they've come through security. We've spoken about um, diversifying Jewish school curriculums to make sure they're telling about the stories of Jews from all over the world, whether those are Jews from Ethiopia or Jews from Iraq, 
uh, many of the stories are not being told, uh, as well as the stories of uh, black community and empire and, and the transatlantic slave trade, which, which don't get enough attention. So we've, we've kind of really looked inwards at ourselves um, because I think if we want to help sort of be a voice to change the world, we have to first of all work out how we how we improve ourselves, and that's the, the, the kind of start we've made. And it and it and it's gone down extremely well. The report has been endorsed by every strand of Judaism. Um, it's it's was very very widely covered. We're now looking at implementation, and we're hopeful that um, from the tragedy of uh, of George Floyd's death, um, we learn and we have a reckoning as a society that makes things better. So Brian, let's uh, let's pause if I may, Phil. Uh, we've got a couple of questions from the floor, and then Brian, if there's time, I know you've got some other questions that you've got as well. So um, and and folks, we're hoping to wrap up at uh, just before uh, eleven o'clock on the east coast of the U.S. Um, if I could invite Judy Taylor to unmute. Uh, Judy, like Brian, is British and living in the U.S. And and Brudy, Judy, we're thrilled to have you with us today, and and we welcome your question. Thank you. Okay, so my question is, uh, with my son going to college, not next year, the year after, and Holly's child going next year, what, what can we do in terms of anti-Semitism anti and anti-Zionism on campus? Because I know that Trump was trying to actually resolve this issue and introduce some new guidelines, but now he's not here. Um, I don't know what Biden, uh, if he has any intentions, but I'm wondering what, what we can do to help these kids. So I can speak to the UK situation, and I, and I think that there are learnings, positive learnings, actually, that, that, that can be transported across the Atlantic. Um, so we have been really alive to this issue. We work closely with uh, one of our major affiliates is the Union of Jewish Students to tackle these problems on campus. One of the things that I think is, um, has really been impressive is our government has been very muscular in taking on this problem. Um, successive secretaries of state for education have written to every university, the current one has been particularly energetic, I must praise him for doing so, to tell them to adopt the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition of anti-Semitism. Uh, that's been followed up by audits. We found in September that about 20% of universities had done so. There's now been a concerted campaign. We've met with vice chancellors alongside student leaders. We're now up to two thirds of UK universities have adopted this definition. It's not by all means all. There are still people trying to fight it in various places. There are still academics who are, who are even academics who are behaving in an anti-Semitic way, I'm sorry to say. But we are pushing very hard and, and, and making substantial progress in this area. Um, so that's like 180 different universities and colleges have now adopted that definition. Um, in terms of responding specifically to the kind of hostility to Israel, uh, this is not a new problem, but you know we're pushing back against uh, pernicious initiatives like Israel Apartheid Week with Israel Awareness Week and trying to educate people about more positive aspects of the state of Israel, as well as challenging some of those um, difficult narratives as we go. And you know, this, one of the things that I was saying earlier about grassroots is as the Labour Party pushes out anti-Semites from the party, as I said, a job that's in progress, not completed, our concern is that we'll see more and more of these people in the trade union movements, in academia, in, in NGOs, and we have to be alive to that as well. But I think we've started in a very strong way in terms of pushing back. And I think that there are probably some learnings uh, across the Atlantic about how, how the, the federal government in the States might be able to do similar things with, with universities in, in the States. Judy, uh, thank you for that question. Uh, Phil, a question that was sent to me directly. Um, can you... Um, can you talk about whether there is an organization similar to APAC that advocates on behalf of Israel with the British Parliament, and, and maybe in the spirit of uh, of even broadening that question further, uh, is there a J Street, uh, you know, contemporary? Um, so uh, this, yes, is it, I mean, there's nothing quite like APAC, and in, in, from time to time we've had good conversations with APAC about whether we should be trying to work with them to set up something in the UK. The way our politics works is a bit different, and it's, so there's a question. But what there certainly are are organisations advocating for Israel in Parliament and, and across um, our political sphere. So they're particularly divided into party friendship groups. So there's a Conservative Friends of Israel, which is extremely uh, strong within the Conservative Party, which is obviously handy because the Conservatives are in government. Um, there's a Labour Friends of Israel, there's a Liberal Democrat Friends of Israel who work to try and advance the case of Israel within their particular parties. And there is coordination between them, some of which we, we help to support. 
Uh, and we made the case for Israel as well. I mean, on, on Thursday, um, I met alongside colleagues with the, the, middle, the UK's Middle East minister to speak about some of the things that, um, that kind of are, are coming across our radar. Um, the UK is generally speaking a good friend of Israel, although there are things around the margins we'd love to, to shove on uh, uh, nose on a bit further. Um, but um, that's the kind of state of play in terms of the kind of pro-Israel community. There are lots of organizations that broadly work together and we try and convene and help um, help them work together. We're coming up with a new plan to help them all um, uh, use, use their, their combined force better. In terms of J Street, um, Yes, there are a couple of organizations, I wouldn't say exactly the same, but are analogous too. So a few years ago, uh, possibly about 10 years ago now, an organization called Yahad was formed, which um, is a kind of pro-Israel, pro, they describe themselves as pro-Israel, pro-peace. Um, that also means anti-occupation. And so they're very actively speaking about, yes, having a, a Zionist Jewish identity, but also opposing some aspects of Israeli policy that they don't agree with. Um, the big difference between, I think, what a strategic thing that happened roughly within a year was that the same year that J Street applied to join the Conference of Presidents and were narrowly uh, rejected from membership. I believe they needed a two thirds majority. They got more than half, but not two thirds. Yahad applied to join the Board of Deputies and did just, they came in instead. It was, so they got it just above the two thirds majority. And I think that's generally been good for us because my perception is that J Street now acts as a sort of opposition force to the mainstream block of Jewish communal organizations, which is a bit tricky, whereas Yahad, whilst it has a different view to what the mainstream organizations do, is part of us. So we, we it's a dialogue within the tent. That being said, there are voices out who are more kind of radical. So a group that's appeared in the last couple of years called Na'amod demonstrates outside our offices uh, <laughs> and outside the Zionist related events um, uh, and is particularly active on social media and is taking a more aggressive stance about where it thinks the Jewish community's leadership should be. You know, that's a dialogue, we'll continue to have it. Um, but it's, uh, it, it, so, so what I would say is, there is a polarization to an extent, and the middle ground is being stretched. But um, so yeah, so there are some anal analogies with, with what's happening in the UK and the US, but some differences too. Thank you. Um, Holly, if I could ask you to unmute, I know you had a question for Phil. Yeah, Phil, I was wondering about the growth of um, the Masorti movement and if you could explain that to our audience because um, it's a more um, similar, um, you know, religious sect to WJC. Mm -hmm. And um, I always, you know, favor going to um, Masorti Shul when we, when we go to London. So if you could just talk about that, please. Sure, I'm no great expert on it, but what I'll say is the following things. It's a relatively new movement in UK terms in that it was formed in the 1960s, basically a schism within centrist orthodoxy where a leading rabbi, uh, Lou Jacobs, um, was kind of basically shunned because his views were seen not to be uh, com in conformity with orthodox beliefs. He, he basically had a view that the Torah was divinely uh, inspired rather than divinely dictated, I suppose, and that was, was too much for the orthodox leadership at the time. And they kind of basically pushed him out. And he kind of led a breakaway with one of the larger um, synagogues, New London Synagogue, um, which became the Masorti movement, the equivalent of conservative Judaism. And um, like I say, it's a smaller part of the Jewish community, but it's growing quite rapidly. And I think it's because, first of all, that the rabbis of the conservative Masorti movement are very dynamic. They, some of the synagogues they have are the closest we have. I don't know if this phenomenon exists in America, but to mega churches, they're a very, um, very popular, charismatic rabbinic leadership, very community focused um, and very popular. Um, I think a lot of people um, find the conservative Masorti movement quite appealing in the context of a, a movement that has very tra is traditional in the way that a lot of British Jews are, but perhaps not as uh, prescriptive as orthodoxy is. So like I say, it, it, is, it is one of the smaller denominations in our terms, but growing rapidly. And I think those are the, the, the reasons for it. It'll be interesting to see you know, how, that, how that growth is sustained, but that's, that, that's a potted summary of the Masorti movement in the UK. Thank you. Uh, Brian, I think we have uh, time for probably two yeah. more from you and then we'll, we'll uh, bring to a close. Yeah, so I, I thought maybe we'd, we'd um, talk a little bit about Israel. Um, you know, obviously there's some recent uh, peace treaties, right, with the Gulf states, which uh, it's been great news to hear, right, that Israel's, uh, you know, expanding the peace process and uh, 
especially with you know countries of the Gulf where you know there's a lot of sort of economic uh, cooperation and economic uh, potential right between the two countries. So maybe you could talk a little bit about how the Board of Deputies is actually you know sponsoring that and helping that. Um, and is that also impacting the Jewish community at all in London, right? Where I know there's a lot of you know the the the, the Arab world has a lot of presence in London. Sure. Uh, yes. Uh, so a few things. So for a few years, we've been working hard to develop relationships with Arab and Muslim majority states embassies in London. London is, as you know, an important di diplomatic hub. So we've been trying to work that out and found some interestingly open doors in, in terms of states that don't have diplomatic relations with Israel, who've been quite happy to have a conversation with us, places like Iraq and Afghanistan and Malaysia. Um, but also in recent years, the UAE and Bahrain. And before the Abraham Accords, in February of, uh, which year was it? Yeah, last year, um, we, we did an event with the with Bahraini Embassy, the first event we'd done with the Gulf State, um, uh, inviting one of their Jewish parliamentarians to address a, a community in London, uh, an event that went down very well, but having the Board of Deputies in Bahrain uh, officially co-hosting an event was quite a new thing. And I, I think in hindsight, um, we also had some more and more prominent engagement with the Emirati Embassy, there was a degree, I think, of soft testing how uh, what they were intending to do would go down because they beginning to sort of slowly speak to their members about, you know, we, we're having good relations with Jews and these Jews happen to be British Jews rather than Israeli Jews, but seeing how that sort of played back. And, and I think we were hopeful to see more of that. And certainly when um, the deals were signed, uh, we, were, we were delighted, we've supported them. Uh, we did what I think was a global first again in, in terms of we did a Hanukkah event that had the ambassadors of Israel, the UAE, Bahrain, and the, the foreign minister, one of our foreign ministers, uh, lighting Hanukkah candles together on screen, a very beautiful moment. It's available to watch. 25,000 people watched that event, most of them in the Gulf, um, because we streamed it through um, Gulf newspapers as well. And that was a really powerful and moving uh, event. And we continue to try and look for and we're in dialogue with those embassies about what more we could be doing together. And there's a few different strands that we're, we're going for. In terms of its impact, I think it will really be a very helpful thing. Um, the Muslim community in the UK is primarily not Arab. It's primarily from South Asia, so uh, Bangladesh and Pakistan. But there is an Arab community. And I'd say that Arab states have a massive influence on the politics of the Muslim community in the sense of investment in mosques, uh, provision of textbooks and so on that are used in madrasas. And I think what we're seeing is as the winds of change blow through the Gulf, which does supply a lot of those textbooks and that funding, you're beginning to see a different attitude in some parts of the Muslim leadership, which say, hold on a minute, the Jews are our allies and they should be our allies and we shouldn't have these hateful uh, textbooks or whatever about Jews anymore. Uh, uh, and and I ha I'm hopeful that that will increasingly change things. There has always been good interfaith relations at various levels in the UK, um, but I'm hopeful that this will allow it to be even better, basically. Cool. Cool. OK, maybe have we got time for one more question, Jack. Yeah. OK. Um, yeah. So just you just touching on social media. Right. I mean, obviously, that is a, a, a hot topic. Um, lots going on. Right. I mean, is, is that kind of, you know, is that a big issue in the UK? Is that monitored? Just a little bit on that and then we will close. It's huge. And this is one where we could really use your help. Um, <laughs> we have a, an institute that grew out the Board of Deputies called the Community Security Trust, which uh, provides security at our institutions and, and does regular monitoring of the situation of anti-Semitism in the UK. And the last few years, it's been a fairly consistent 40% of incidents are being tracked online. And that's only the start of it. It's just what's reported to them. So that's a huge percentage. And we have been trying to speak to all the social media companies, Facebook, Twitter, Google, YouTube, and so on, uh, and, and, and TikTok, and trying to get them to eradicate anti-Semitism online. And they'll take down some things, but we regularly run into problems with them, not understanding anti-Semitism. We had a threat, a bomb threat against our organization, which when we reported it via the normal channels, they said, this does not violate our uh, community standards. Obviously, we spoke directly to their public policy team who said, oh, yeah, it probably does violate our public policy standards, say bomb the board of deputies and guns and bullets are the only way to deal with this organization. Um, it's, it, you know, but it, it is incredible. We had a running battle with them, with Facebook, to try and get them to stop thinking about Holocaust denial as a kind of completely neutral thing. 
um, and we were glad to force them alongside American colleagues to into changing that view. And in the UK, we've got um, what's called the online harms bill that's going to be coming forward through Parliament. We're trying hard to get them actually to ask the social media companies to have to adopt the IHRA definition uh, of anti-Semitism to make sure that they are using that standard to judge anti-Semitism. We'd like to see in-country monitoring uh, teams because we think that teams that are not in the UK may not understand the political, the linguistic or the cultural context of anti-Semitism. Uh, we'd like to use this opportunity to really bear down on, on this. But, you know, a lot of the problems are because uh, these, Ameri these are companies in America, which has very strong free speech laws, and they are very reticent to, to curb what we would consider to be hate speech. And so I think um, support of the, of the American Jewish community, particularly in getting this balance right between free speech and hate speech, would be really helpful to us uh, and across the world, because social media now has such a huge market share of, of anti-Semitism. I'd say it's the uh, online is the new front line in the fight against anti-Semitism. So I have the uh, unenviable task this morning of bringing things to a close. We could clearly keep this uh, discussion going, but we're conscious of folks' time, including yours, Phil. Phil, uh, you are such a born teacher. You uh, make these issues so clear, and uh, we've learned so much this morning. And uh, most of us don't go to work where we have to pass through protesters or uh, have um, bomb threats on social media directed at our organization. So we, um, we, we bring enormous empathy and admiration for the task that you've taken on. Uh, Brian, and we're so thrilled to have you part of the, the Westchester Jewish Center community and uh, your perspective and context really enhance this conversation. And none of this would be happening this morning without our fellow congregant, uh, Holly Fink, who leads the World Jewry Committee. Um, Holly, on behalf of WJC, thank you for continuing to tee up one interesting program after another. Um, in that spirit, uh, I think you've got another one this evening. Is that right? Why don't you tell us about that, what you've got coming and, and bring us to a close? Um, yeah, first of all, thank you so much, Jack, for doing this with with us. Um, again, you you bring so much um, to every World Jury program. I, I can't thank you enough. Um, and Brian, that was a treat for, for me, <laughs> <laughs> including your sister and your children um, and so many of our friends. So um, thank you, Brian. That was really educational. And Phil, wow. <clears throat> Thank you, Phil. Hi, this yeah. is a big highlight for me. Um, the World Jewry, this is what we're all about, is bringing Jewish life in other parts of the world to us. And, and you did that so beautifully, Phil. And so I'm so lucky that I came to you through our common friend, Liz Harris. So thank you, Phil. Thank you so much for having me. It was a real pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you, Phil. Um, that was really, really meaningful being married to a, a British Jew. I can't, I can't even tell you how much I learned today. Um, <laughs> Yes, tonight we do have another World Jury um, Committee <laughs> event, if you can believe it. Um, this is the, the, the last of our events um, this wonderful morning. And tonight we are hosting two Holocaust survivors named Saul and Ruby. They formed a band called the Holocaust Survivor Band. They live in Florida now. They're both around 96 years old. Um, one, one of them, Ruby, has Alzheimer's. Um, and we won't be able to hear from them for much longer. They are amazing, amazing men. I hope you can tune in at 7.30 tonight. A man named Todd Leckert made a documentary about them and he followed them just as their wives were passing away. Um, and their dream was to perform in Poland, of course, where, th where they survived um, horrible events, as you all know. Um, and their band made it to Poland and they performed and it's an incredible thing to see. And they will be performing live for us tonight, playing music too. So if you want to be on Zoom one more time on a Sunday, I don't blame you if you don't, um, please come. It's at 7.30 tonight. And again, thank you so much to everyone. And with that, we will leave everyone from Israel to England, to New York City, to Long Island, to Connecticut, <laughs> Phil. We had a lot of different parts of the, the Jewish world on this call. So thank you everybody and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. That was amazing. Thanks, Allie. You always that was so great. Thank you so much. I love your you guys, the dynamic Fink duo, Jack and 